be here, folks. The problem with this morning is all these cars got my way on trying to get over here. <laughs> all right. Father, I pray that you'd give me wisdom. Teach your word, Lord, and open our hearts to receive it. In your holy name, amen. All right, now turn to Matthew chapter 23 and verse number 29. Matthew 23, 29. And uh, I'm going to read for, read for you for uh, Hebrews. Hebrews chapter number 11. All right. It says, God who at sundry times and in divers manner spake in time past of the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. He's talking about the prophets and he's comparing Christ to the prophets. Now we know that Moses said plainly, the Lord your God will raise up unto thee a prophet like unto me. And the Lord Jesus Christ certainly was a prophet. A prophet is one who speaks forth into the future. God gives him the vision, the word, whatever, and he tells you what's going to happen. In Matthew chapter number 23 and verse 29, here's what the Lord said about. Woe unto you scribes and Pharisees. Hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous, and say, If we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore you be witnesses to yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. And there's nothing in the world like self righteousness that will come between you and God. It creates a real problem. And in verse 34, Matthew 23, Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify. Some of them shall, be, that shall you scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. So he is bringing a uh, blistering attack upon their religion, upon their religious uh, understanding, because they should know a prophet when one comes. And, uh, and, of course, what he's doing, preparing them for himself. Matthew 23, verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. He came into his own, and his own received him not. So a prophet, therefore, the Bible says is not without honor in his own country among his own people. Is not this the carpenter's son, they said. Luke chapter 11 and verse number 50, Scripture says, The blood of all the prophets, which was shed from the foundation of the world, may be required of this generation. Now stop for a moment and think on that. He said, if Sodom and Gomorrah had had the preaching you've had, they would have repented. Uh, God sent uh, Jonah to Nineveh. These were pagan people, but he walked through the streets of Nineveh for 40 days and said, God's going to destroy this place, repent. And they did. The king repented, sat in sackcloth and ashes, and they all did. That tells you that God Almighty knows exactly who is going to respond to the word. It will not return void. It will accomplish that which he pleases and prosper in the thing whereto he hath sent it. But notice the accountability. See, this is, this is the issue. You have to understand this is a major issue in the Bible. The blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. That's amazing. That's utterly amazing. And from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zacharias, which, was, which perished between the altar and the temple, verily I say to you, it shall be required of this generation. So we've got an issue going on here. Quite an issue. And uh, he told them in, in John chapter number 14... Look over here what he says in John 14. Let's just go to John 9. John 9. Let 
John 9, verse 39. For judgment, I am coming to the world. He doesn't have to do it, just his presence does it. He doesn't have to say a word, the fact that he's there. He said, for judgment, I am come to the world that they which see not might see. And they, that, and they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say we sin, therefore your sin remaineth. He didn't say you would be sinless. That has nothing to do with the text. What he says is that you would not be accountable for rejecting the truth and the light. And this is exactly what's going on because we, all, we know all of us are sinners. 1 John 1, 9, it says, for all have sinned, all of us. If you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself and the truth is not in you. So the issue is certainly as clear as it can be. The Lord said, uh, if you say you see, and here's the light, and you turn yourself away from the light, then you turn into spiritual blindness, and you're accountable for it. And that's a sad state. That's a very sad state, and that's exactly what Israel did. Now I want you to look at Luke chapter number 20 and verse number 9. Luke 20, verse number 9. In Luke chapter number 20 and verse number 9, I want you to see what you're reading on the surface of what it says, but then look past the surface and look at the bigger picture that you're being presented with. Luke chapter number 20, verse 9. Then began he to speak to the people this parable. You remember the parable? You remember what the purpose of the parable was? You remember when they rejected him? And he began to speak to them in parables. The disciple says, why do you speak in parables? He said, because they that see cannot see that, they, that, uh, that it's given to you to know. You're, you're privileged for you to understand a great truth. And I'm going, to, I'm going to give it to you in parables. In plainer words, only the eyes and ears of those that God opens will be able to receive this. He said, a certain man planted a vineyard. What's a vineyard? Well, God said of Israel, you're a noble vine, remember? You're a noble vine. And he said, what turned you into this degenerate vine than you are? If you read Isaiah chapter 5, you'll get an idea of what he's talking about. A certain man planted a vineyard. In other words, the Lord created Israel and led it forth to husbandmen. I gave you the prophets. I gave you your teachers. I gave you kings <clears throat> and went into a far country for a long time. And at the season he sent a servant to the husbandmen that they should give him of the fruit of the vineyard. And they that should give of him of the fruit of the vineyard, but the husbandmen beat him and sent him away empty. And again he sent another servant, and they beat him also and entreated him shamefully and sent him away empty. These are the prophets that he's sending to them. This is the word that's coming to them. He's trying to speak to them, to receive his word. And they third, again, he sent a third. They wounded him also, cast him out. Then said the Lord of the vineyard, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. See that? It doesn't get any greater than that. It doesn't. There's none greater. There's no clearer message. There's no, there's no more to wait for. I will send them my son. It may be they will reverence him when they see him. So he came into his own, his own received him not. If anybody on this earth should have known who the Messiah was, it should have been the Jews. Amen. Amen. It should have been the Jews. Pontius Pilate said, I find no fault in him. He didn't think about a Messiah, but he said, this man's not guilty. The pagans over there in the book of Acts, if you remember when we were talking this past Wednesday night, uh, they, they found no reason for this man to be put to death. And yet they, these Jews were after him. The apostle Paul we're talking about, they were after him. And so they sent him on to Rome. They said, our law, does not tell a judge, our law does not condemn a man to death until he has an opportunity to defend himself, to face his accusers. And of course, the Apostle Paul was a Roman citizen, which gave him a privilege in the sense that he had a right to a trial to face his accusers. Yet these Jews had brought in false witnesses and they wanted to put him to death. So they had proven over and over and over again, time and time again, that they didn't care anything about the truth. 
or altruism or anything of that nature. It was all expedient. What could I gain from it? How can I advance myself? What's in it for me? And that's exactly what you got on Capitol Hill up here, just about 99% of them, same thing. But anyway, I will send my beloved son, and maybe they will reference him when they see, reverence him when they see him. But when the husbandmen saw him, now watch this, they reasoned among themselves, saying, this is the heir. Now look at that again. This is the heir. He said in the book of Acts, had they known he was the Lord of glory, they wouldn't have crucified him. Who's the they? The mob. The mob. Uh, 999 times out of 1,000, the mob is as ignorant as it can be. The mob. But the leaders, oh yeah, when he was raising the dead, when Lazarus was raised from the dead, they went back and told Caiaphas, he liked that, and he prophesied that one should die for the nation than for, for, to keep the whole nation from perishing. Being the high priest, God used him as a prophet. Think about that. <laughs> he spoke through him and prophesied, and what he said was the truth, folks. It was the truth. Just like the donkey in the Old Testament. He can speak through anything he pleases. The Lord said, these rocks can cry out. So they said, this is the heir. In other words, this is the legitimate heir to this kingdom that we're holding, fighting for. This is the heir, they said. And uh, uh, let me find the text here. Reverence, they said, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him that the inheritance may be ours. Take it from him. There you go. They're murderers. John 8, 44, he said, you're every father of the devil. The devil was a liar from the beginning. Satan's a murderer. Murderer. You say, I've never murdered anybody. The nature of sin includes everything there is in violation of the holiness of God. You may not go to the depths of some of it, but it's all connected. It's all connected because one can lead to another, steps downward to that point. And so this is the heir. Let us kill him and the inheritance may be ours. So they cast him out of the vineyard, killed him. What therefore shall the Lord of that vineyard do to them? He shall come and destroy these husbandmen and give the vineyard to others. Now we are reaching into... into uh, uh, into prophecy and into dispensations. He came to the Jew. The Jew received him. He said the kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven is going to be taken away from you. And it's going to be given to someone else who brings forth the fruit thereof. And so since they rejected the Messiah, how could they have inheritance to the kingdom? They can't. The king has to come back in order for them to have the kingdom. Can't do it. Can't do it. It's an impossibility. He shall come and destroy these husbandmen and shall give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, God forbid. And he beheld them and said, What is this then that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. Whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. He goes into a spiritual application of this truth. Christ is the stone that is cut out of a mountain. The stone represents the spiritual kingdom of Christ and smites the Gentile image on its feet and it collapses immediately and down it comes. The stone, the smiting stone, the stone of Christ. Christ is the stone in the Bible and the stone here represents his spiritual authority. Notice he says, the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. In plain words, you are either going to have to accept him, and if you don't accept him, there will be no Israel, and there will be no temple, and there will be no future. So when do they accept him? When he comes. When he comes. When he comes. And he said, this is the spiritual application. Whosoever shall fall upon this stone shall be broken. If you've fallen upon it, if it's, just, it's a stumbling stone, you know. If you fall upon it, what does it do? It breaks your heart, it converts you, and you're saved. But whosoever shall be broken, but on whomsoever shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Remember the stone cut out of the mountain? Down it comes. 
And you're not going to stop him either. When this time comes and you're watching it approach, you're living in the generation, you're watching it approach. How far, I don't know, but we're, wa we're watching it. I marvel at the stuff popping up every week practically. It will grind him to powder. So to reject this Lord Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, to reject the heir of the vineyard, you'll wind up being ground to powder. The chief priests and the scribes at the same hour sought to lay hands on him, and they feared the people. I imagine they did. <laughs> I imagine. It didn't, it didn't excite them too much at all, did it? No, he put, put them in their place, and they feared the people. My goodness gracious. For they perceived he had spoken this parable against them. See that? They understood, even though they didn't understand all the spiritual significance of it, there was enough of it they understood to know he was talking about them. They knew it, but they feared the people. You read the New Testament and how these Pharisees dealt with Christ and all of the, all of the politics involved and all of this back and forth that goes on. Nothing's changed. 2,000 years ago, it was exactly the way it is today. Exactly. Not a thing has changed. That's one of the reasons I believe the Bible. It doesn't try to paint man as something he's not. Now, Hebrews chapter number 3 and verse number 1 says this. Hebrews 3, 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Now, notice he uses the word apostle. All right. Apostle's translation is sent. He's a sent one. Apostelos, the Greek word. It means he's been sent. And so the Lord Jesus Christ said, the Father hath sent me. So what does that mean? That means that he has special authority, special credentials, and special power. And he said, as the Father hath sent me, even so I send you. Referring to the apostles. That's why he called them apostles. Disciples are not so. A disciple is a learner. I'm a disciple. I'm not an apostle. I'm a disciple of the Lord, a believer, a learner, a follower of the Lord Jesus. And uh, if you ever meet up with an apostle, you'll know it. Anybody ever met an apostle? If you ever meet one, you'll know it. I've never met one. I know some folks who say they are, but uh, sometimes, you know, you can get carried away with yourself. But uh, the apostle and high priest of our profession. All right? Kohen in Hebrew. If you see the word Kohen in a man's name, or Levi in a man's name, that means that he, his genealogy carries him all the way back to Aaron, priesthood. And uh, this is important for them because they're going to reinduce the priesthood when they build the temple. So he's the high priest, all right? The priest. Now, what's important about this? Well, he's the only man that ever lived that fulfills the three major offices of Israel, prophet, priest, and king. David, David was a priest because he went in and offered, and so a king. God allowed him to do that. David did, but he was not a prophet. A prophet, priest, and king, there's only one that ever lived that fulfilled that, and that's the Lord Jesus. Now, he's called the second man, the last Adam, okay? And he's also uh, the Lord from heaven. The first man arose from the ground, Adam, was brought forth from the dust of the earth. His body was fashioned, and God breathed into that body the breath of life. All mankind, according to Romans 5, just go back and read it, came forth from that first Adam who came up from the ground, and he gave you an earthly life. That last Adam came up from the ground too. He came up from the ground, and he was resurrected from the dead. His life, did, his being resurrected from the dead, something had changed. And let me tell you what it was. He could never die again. All right? That's why he's called the first fruits of them that slept. The first fruits. First fruits are important in the Bible because it, uh, it denotes what follows. First fruits. To never die again. Therefore, when he arose from the dead, he is a priest 
forever after the order of Melchizedek when he rises from the dead. Not until then. Until then, the Lord Jesus Christ is a prophet and a prophet speaking to man, prophet given the word of God. This is why the apostle who wrote Hebrews says, God sundry times and divers manners and time past has spoken to us by the prophets. But in these last days, he hath spoken to us by his son. The Lord Jesus Christ, therefore, is compared with the prophet, and rightfully so. He's a prophet. God speaks to us through him. And, uh, you know, we need to be careful about that. Uh, how many of you have a red letter Bible? Red letter New Testament. I've got two or three, and I've got both, got both kinds. Some aren't red, and some are. And uh, some folks uh, think that that is, uh, you know, is an arbitrary thing. It shouldn't have been done like that. Well, there's no sense in arguing something like that. Truth of the matter is, when you open up the Bible and you see those red letters, it pretty well points you right to it. You're here's the Lord talking. Let's listen to what he has to say. And, uh, and the reason you do is because you want to know what he said, right? What did Christ say? This is important because when you get on over in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, who wrote 13 books, and uh, a lot of people like to compare Paul with Christ and say Paul was a heretic and he created his own Christian religion. And the religion that Paul created had nothing to do with the faith of Christ and what he taught while he was here on this earth. So they pit one against another. What they've done is destroy your New Testament when they do that. And, and, the, and they do that because they're ignorant of the Bible. So he was a prophet. But now he becomes a priest. And he becomes a priest because he offered himself unto God. By his own blood, he entered into the Holy of Holies, and there he offered his blood to God, and then he sat down at the right hand of the Father. All right? The Bible says we are begotten again. We are begotten, born again, to the, uh, uh, born again by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This is what Peter said. So what's that mean? That means when he rose from the dead, that ratified the New Testament, the New Covenant, Hebrews chapter number 9, and therefore you can be born of the Spirit of God. That's a, book, now that's a big deal. And when that happened, he became the last Adam. Be being the last Adam, all of those that are born of the Spirit of God, the whole family of God, will have to be related to the Lord Jesus Christ in one way or another. He's the last Adam. So when we come to his priesthood, it's important to understand that he's not a priest after Aaron, which limits his priesthood to his lifetime but he's a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek is a conjunction of two Hebrew words, Melech, which is king, Zedek, Zedek, which is righteous. He's the king of righteousness, and he will reign as the king of righteousness. Wars and rumors of wars, hegemony and all that goes with it when you take and run over and this and that and so forth and so on to try to scratch and claw and take care of much of the land that you can, that you can get one nation rises against another nation. You ought to study sometime, and I've been studying this, the reason that nations go to war. Why do they go to war? Why are they, why are they, why are they warring? Have you ever read in the history of mankind where the people declared war on the people of another country? Think about it. No. No, it's the polecaticians that de de declare war on another country. Yes, they do. They have reasons for it. One of the major reasons today for war against countries is their resources, to take what they have, their oil and what have you. That's one of the major reasons today that they declare war. But you know, just like anything else, you can cover it up by projecting, well, we're doing this to stop something or this or that. But the truth of the matter is, it's not for that reason. You remember Smedley Butler, he was a major general in the Marine Corps. And Smedley Butler, at that time, we're, look, we're talking the 30s and 40s, uh, he, that apparently they say it was the highest rank you could attain in the Marine Corps. Marine Corps is not it's small compared to the Army. Never had a five-star general like MacArthur. And Smedley Butler said that war is a racket. He said it's a racket. He said, I went down to South America, Middle America. I went down there for the bankers and for the oil men and for this and that and this and that. And he said, I got what they wanted. He said, but it cost the lives of an awful lot of young men. And he said, I'm tired of it. That's what he said, I'm tired of it. This is not to say that as a patriot, if you have an invading army or if there's some reason you need to, to project your power somewhere that you don't do it, you do. 
But you, wouldn't it be wonderful if you were led by people whose sole purpose was just to, to maintain the sovereignty of this nation and, 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 and throughout the world instead of warmongers? I heard it said of one politician, said he never saw a war he didn't like. <laughs> That's what happens. That's what happens. Young men die. I went to school with two of them. You can read it from Rural High School. 18 years old. They've been dead now for 50 years. Vietnam. And now in Vietnam, you may have clothes. I think this shirt was made in Vietnam. You have clothes and stuff that's made in Vietnam, right? What's the point here? That's something to think about. Wars. He's the high priest of the whole race. The scripture says that these priests were made without an oath. But the Lord Jesus was made by an oath. And because the Lord could swear by no greater, he swore by himself that thou art a priest forever. In other words, if you are going to remove Christ from his priesthood, you're going to have to remove the father who swore and gave an oath and made him priest. And of course, that's foolishness to even think that, that, that you can happen. His priesthood is forever. He's the priest of all mankind, though. Aaron was only a priest to Israel. He couldn't go any further than that. It's called the Aaronic priesthood. And it was a big deal because they had no priesthood like that until they came out of Egypt. They'd been there for 400 years. They came out of Egypt, and they came out of Egypt as a nation. They went into Egypt as 12 tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel. But they came out of Egypt a nation. In other words, the joining together of the 12 tribes to form one nation. And it was then that God instituted the priesthood. And Aaron, of course, was the brother of Moses. And Aaron became the first high priest. And the priesthood, therefore, demands that there be a place to worship. And they had a place to worship. It was called the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a tent. And it was a tent structure. It was portable to be taken from one place to the next. And God led them through the wilderness by a, by a cloud of glory in the daytime and protected them at night with a, with, a, with a cloud of fire, with a wall of fire. And these were his people, and he moved them away, and he moved them into the Holy Land, and he had to drive out the inhabitants of the Holy Land to give them that promise that he gave to Abraham in Genesis chapter number 12 and chapter number 15. He had to drive them from the land. And so there they are, a priesthood. But the priest would die. And when the priest died, another priest would take his place. Then he'd die. Then another priest would take his place. Then he'd die. So therefore, the relationship God had with the, each of these priests was only temporal. It could only be temporal. But the Lord Jesus Christ is raised up as a priest. And here's when he shows up. If you remember, Abraham paid tithe after he came back from the slaughter of the kings. And he picked up his nephew Lot. He paid his tithe to somebody. You remember who it was? Yeah, Melchizedek. Remember the name, Melchizedek, the king of righteousness. King of what? He was the king of Salem. Melchizedek was the king of Salem. Where's Salem? What is Salem? Jerusalem, the city of peace that has that word shalom or Salem in it. This is why it's called that. At that time, it was not called Jerusalem. But at that time, it was the center of the worship of God because Melchizedek was there 1,900 years before, uh, before, uh, before Christ, all right? When did Moses live? You might have to remember the date on Moses. 1,400 years before Christ, all right? We're looking at 500 years between Melchizedek and Aaron, 500 years. Job worshiped under Melchizedek. Abraham worshiped under Melchizedek. But when they were, and these, the reason for this is because they're not a nation, they're just tribes. And, but when we have a nation that comes out of Egypt, we have all 12 tribes that now are worshiping under Aaron, and Aaron is going to lead them. And he's going to lead them into the promised land. So, the priesthood of Christ is a priesthood that is typified by Melchizedek in the Old Testament. 
Now, I don't want to get into a thing about, well, Melchizedek was Christ, pre-incarnate and all that. Some say he was Shem, this, that, and so forth and so on. You can't prove any of it. But the truth of the matter is, when you read Hebrews chapter number 7, without father, without mother, no, none, of the, none of the genealogy that, that humanity has like us, then it makes you think that Melchizedek might have had some kind of relationship with Christ in a way that we don't understand, some kind of a spiritual uh, a connection with him. In plain words, Melchizedek might have been something like an angel or more than an angel. He might have been an appearance and a representation. Who knows? Because there's no record of his birth and there's no record of his death. He's an odd, unusual individual. And this is what God left them, to worship under him. So when Christ arose from the dead, he arose a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And the reason it's so important is because under Melchizedek, the whole world, all mankind, Jew, Gentile, bond free, whoever, wherever, whenever, now can be accepted into the family of God. And that, thank God, I'm, I'm glad for that. I'm glad. The Bible says we have an altar they know not of that serve the tabernacle. They had holy ground then. We have holy ground now. Their holy ground was established by the Lord. Now anywhere you put your foot is holy ground. Amen. Different. So the Bible says, he, because he had an unchangeable priesthood, he's able to save them to the uttermost. Now, what do you think about this? You remember what I said about life? You remember what I said about the priest? When the priest walked in, he had the breastplate. He had the 12 stones on the breastplate. He also had it on his shoulder, the epaulets, they call it. He carried the shoulder, represented his strength. He was carrying Israel by his strength. The priesthood, the, the plate on the priesthood was near his heart. So he's carrying them in his spirit and in his soul into the presence of the Lord. All right. He would come and intercede for the people. He would pray for the people, stand for the people. But then he died. Somebody would have to come and take his place. And so there was a chain there. It was broken from one to the next to the next to the next. But listen to what the writer of Hebrews says. He says, but this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Now, how's he? look how he connects it. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Unbroken, everlasting life. Here's the bottom line. Let me tell you how long your eternal life will last. It'll last as long as Christ lasts. Because he is our life. And I believe it'll be forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Why? Because he's God, that's why. It's impossible for God to die. It's an impossibility. Impossibility. God cannot die. And so he, uh, he, he's able to save to the other. The word uttermost here is a good word too. It, it literally means in every sense, in every respect, and to, and, to the, and to the fullest and greatest degree, he's able to save you. That means from the moment he saves you till the time you leave this world, he's going to stick with you. He'll never forsake you. Say, well, I forsook him. That's all right. He'll chasten you. How many of you have ever had, well, I don't know if I want to ask that or not. <laughs> and the Lord ever take him to the woodshed. <laughs> oh, you don't want to go back, do you? No. And when he took you to the woodshed, did you know it was the Lord taking you to the woodshed? Sure you did. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then when you were in the woodshed, did you say to yourself, how stupid can somebody be? Amen. Amen. And then you say to yourself, I'm not going to do this again. And the good Lord says, I still love you, son. And I'm doing this because I love you. And I want the fruit of righteousness in your life. Now come and follow the one that you love and the one that loves you. And your life will matter. Let's have prayer. And we'll start service here in a few minutes. Brother Tickell, dismiss us, please.